With that said, it's time to begin, to begin our discussion and analysis and please to hand over uh, the floor to Professor Diane Ring. Dear Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So yes, we are um, very eager to get started. Um, I just want to add a few more details about how we're going to proceed today. As Costa mentioned, we have three panels. Uh, we will uh, They'll run about an hour each and we'll take a short five minute break between the three panels. Um, but before we begin the panels, uh, we have a special guest, Wouter van Gelderen, who is going to present a case study uh, that really I think will serve as a nice launching point uh, and kind of get us situated a bit um, as we begin today's panel. Um, just gonna give a very brief uh, 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 sort of bio of Wouter. Uh, he's a, a lifelong consultant in finance, tax and technology, and he's worked for uh, several of the big four audit firms as well as consulting companies. Uh, and he is uh, focused on a host of offshoring projects that focus on labor and tax issues, uh, but also interested in looking at the impact of blockchain, robotics, and artificial intelligence uh, in the structuring of business and transactions. Um, so at this point, Walter, I'd like to turn it over to you um, for your case study. Thank you. Diane, thank you so much. I hope everyone can hear me uh, properly. Uh, I will share my screen, if allowed, Diane, uh, with uh, the four slides that I have presented. You gave me 10 minutes. That's quite a challenge to tell a long story, but I will do my utmost to uh, to have that done within that time. Um, maybe to uh, start with... Yeah, I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, a little bit of context, uh, I think. My case study is right in the middle uh, of the entire uh, discussion of this afternoon. I will talk about technology. Uh, I will talk about tax and fraud prevention, uh, although the tax side of it is minimal. I will talk about uh, whistleblowing and the ethics and uh, challenges around that. Uh, and of course, uh, during the forum, I'll be happy to answer further questions uh, around this case. Um, as said, uh, I am uh, Walter van Gelderen, uh, used to be called Walter, as I've worked most of my time international, but my first name gives me away. I am uh, guilty of being Dutch. Uh, I, I worked about in about 40 countries uh, uh, and places all over the world. Uh, maybe to note a few that are relevant, I did spend uh, significant time in Kiev. I did some work in Tel Aviv to name uh, and, and Islamabad to name a few of the hotspots. Uh, yeah, so I am not only someone who works from the office inventing solutions, but also drives these solutions into countries all the way till they're implemented. And the core about my career has been around uh, the building of tax hubs, back office hubs, uh, shared service centers, uh, everything that was uh, known in the consulting world as global business services. And of course, to be able to do that, you need to have a very good understanding of technology involved because yeah, working from home and working on a remote location might seem natural to the generation that has started working post COVID. But I can tell you 25 years ago, this was still quite a challenge uh, as the technology to facilitate it was not there yet. Um, the case study is really about a new invention and a new solution and that I helped develop uh, about now by five years ago. I will refrain from any names or companies or whatever, but uh, uh, keep it as anonymous as possible. I think it's more about the case study and how it works within the big four than it is about uh, uh, particular details of, uh, of my personal experience. Um, and as a consultant, of course, uh, I have one slide about the solution that I have helped or led to develop. And uh, we started facilitating the work in global business services by new technology. And in this case, we developed a solution in what was called touchless business processing. So the game was to 
work remote and work as automated as possible and in some of the volume and core processes within the finance area, make sure we do it with as minimal manual intervention as possible. And the pilot for this was a solution that was called uh, touchless invoice processing. Uh, a little bit of an overview of what does this solution mean, what does it do, but also a little bit how it works. Uh, I could do it in a three hour version, but I'll give you the two minute version right here, Diane. Uh, uh, we receive invoices, any company receives invoices, uh, and those invoices could be a piece of paper in various layouts and formats. It could be a scan, a PDF, or something like. It also could be an electronic file that we get from a vendor, a vendor portal, or by email, or what, what, whatever. Uh, and of course, it can be in any language. It can be in Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, uh, uh, Greek, uh, uh, Hebrew, we've even done. Uh, we receive those invoices, and the first step that we take we, is we analyze the invoice using uh, an artificial intelligence-enabled OCR-like system. What's interesting about this, we use pattern recognition to figure out what is exactly in the invoice on a quite disruptive and change way to what is typically done with traditional OCR, because that is very sensitive to uh, faults, to typos, to points, to grayscales, to whatever. So the immediate first step is to check this invoice. Is it indeed a legal invoice in the country where it is received? It also does checks, and that is the second step, what we call the VAT engine. It checks not only is the legal invoice, but also are the local uh, rules and regulations uh, from the sender and receiver, are they compliant? So one of the checks is the bank account on the invoice, indeed the same bank account as we know from the vendor. And if not so, it doesn't mean fraud per se. It could be that the company has a new bank account, but we should go into validation of that process. Also, if we know where the invoice comes from and where the products are going to, we can check uh, VAT uh, and VAT applicability uh, on a line by line basis, which is completely different than the current process where we just assume where whatever is on the invoice is correct. Uh, even in the case of certain countries, uh, I mentioned India, we can take the VAT amount and put it on an escrow account to prevent further fraud uh, and, and prevent things from being taken away from the tax authority and being uh, rightfully paid. The last step is uh, what we call the uh, accounting robot. Based on the content of the invoice, we make a entry in the books of the receiving company to recognize uh, the commitment to the vendor and to recognize the cost uh, to reflect the appropriate product. And we use that by a robot and not by artificial intelligence. Why? Because it's very important that the rule based follows the local rules of the local chart of accounts and accounting principles. And, and by doing so, we've actually built a solution that on a line and invoice by invoice basis is compliant with uh, local and international rules and regulations. It is fully transparent because on every step of the process, we know where the invoice is, where there could be a manual intervention, where there is no manual intervention, why the robot is choosing what the robot is doing with this. We go to uh, very close to zero touch uh, processing. We've applied this at several large multinationals. And within six weeks, our average core was ranging between 88% and 93% success. So this technology really worked. And of course, it's not only fraud prevention, uh, it is signaling uh, there are alarms going off if something is misappropriately or is incorrect. Uh, a non-legal invoice will be returned to the vendor with a full audit trail. So any accountant loves this because they can check what's happening step by step and they just have to check the rule base and the accounting rules whether they're applied appropriately because the system does it every way every time the same uh, the, the same way so this should make a lot of companies happy 
this should make uh, the processing very transparent. It should make the processing very compliant. So this solution and this way of handling invoices, and this is the first pilot for incoming invoices, and we were planning to take that further to other processes, uh, should have made a lot of people very happy and impressed because it reduces costs while improving quality and improving compliance. So far, so good. But then uh, what happened was actually a quite a disruption. Um, and the disruption was on several levels. The first level is that inside the management uh, of the audit firm, this solution, which was highly competitive and a, 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 a well-kept secret, was actually shared with a major competitor. And in particularly a major competitor who didn't just want to do the same, but a, a competitor who had an interest in the outsourcing industry. So who would have a significant loss in business as a result of these types of solutions. Um, given the disruptive nature of it, uh, it was also not 100% welcomed by the tax advisors who in the old school way used sampling to check whether um, compliance of VAT was adhered to. But with this solution, it could be done on an invoice by invoice basis, making it 10,000 times as effective. However, with that, you know, there was a loss of revenue for all the local tax advisors who would come in once a year and do a sampling check and write a nice report. And then of course, come to do corrective actions. The system already had it in, in it. Also, uh, when uh, a process is fully auditable with a full audit trail and fully compliant, uh, this doesn't make the auditors per se happy. It also doesn't make the company per se happy because it excludes fraud and of course it reduces work for all parties uh, involved and last but not least you know this solution when deployed at large scale and that's what we're talking about really uh, has an impact on the offshoring industry because of uh, managing the robot you need uh, about five percent of the people differently trained people but five percent of the people that you would do in a typical offshoring uh, situation of this this type of work. Um, what happened? Um, and this is my my last slide. Uh, as this solution is quite disruptive, yeah. Uh, and and the information pricing uh, client names were shared with competitors, uh, and it was done by senior leaders within the audit firm. Uh, I had to file a report that there was a significant breakage. Yeah, um, the solution became shared. And of course that sharing allowed it uh, instead of centralized ownership of the solution and centralized deployment into everyone internally and externally having an opinion about this, uh, working out the fatal flaw, trying to drag out the process to ever that incentives. And uh, yeah, the the the, end of the solution was really trying to destroy the solution as it was too disruptive uh, for, for, for business. Why this has happened? I think a couple of the um, things you would expect that an international audit firm would have control of these kind of processes and control of the compliance. But you know, if you look inside the company, there is a lot of debate and a lot of discussion within an audit firm. I think, uh, first of all, we think as an audit firm, maintaining the rules, checking books, uh, yeah, and if they're checking books and giving an, an, an audit statement, they must have very strict rules and they should maintain those rules all internally. But if you look internally, it's really the margin and the money uh, the work uh, and the financial incentives that drives this business. Uh, of course, the same is true for the tax advisors. But if you look a little bit um, lower to that, because this behavior drives the protectionism of the current owners. I told you the example of the tax advisors who'd rather go in and do a quite inefficient audit 
once a year, make locally a lot of money versus deploy this global solution that can handle with everything and make sure that the earning potential is there, but it's a couple of cents on every invoice, which is enough to maintain the rule engine and maintain the checks, uh, which means there is a shift of profit from one group to the other. Um, also, so that is the local versus central one. There's also a discussion between the junior and the senior, senior part, particularly in partnerships, as the big four all are, because, of course, the seniors try to maximize their earnings uh, today. And as soon as they got closer to retirement, they have no incentive anymore to invest in innovation and technology. They want to cash out to ensure a pension fund as large as possible, while as the junior uh, partners who are expecting to be part of our long while, they would love to invest in new disruptive technology because if they're the first, it could build the future. Also at the discussion, core of the discussion, and this discussion is wider than just the big four and the tax advisors with, with, uh, and auditors within, it is also true for the clients because at the core of this disruptive technology, touchless processing means uh, there is a trade-off of labor versus technology. And clearly with these kind of solutions, technology is winning. But most companies, particularly in the client side, I had a lot of discussions because the leaders at client side are very often paid and rewarded on how many people they manage. So if they manage hundreds of people in India or the Philippines who are doing data entry on, on invoices uh, with various degrees of accuracy, I might say, uh, those people, those managers will lose uh, a lot of their status, but also probably their earnings, which relates to the point of job, uh, job security, payment and incentives. So lesson learned, uh, and, and I think this is very high over and there's much more to say about it, but given the time, that will be my last remark. Given this high degree of disruption in this technology, uh, it has a lot of enemies and the game that's being played is not really a fair game because it is very incentivized by people behavior and partially their drive for their own rewards and incentives. Otherwise then, building a better working world in many ways. Diane, back to you. Thank you very much, Walter. And, and your, uh, this was a really um, powerful example, I think, as you said, to hit across a number of the themes that uh, we'll be exploring throughout today. So thank you uh, for launching us on that. Um, a couple of other uh, sort of starting points. Um, uh, you know, I if you have questions as attendees, uh, you just saw that Costa posted, please um, put them in the Q&A feature and then I will moderate them and bring them into our Zoom as we go throughout. I may hold questions for a little bit later uh, if I think it's gonna fit with another panel, but please um, feel free to just add your questions in uh, to the Q&A function. Um, so